Do you know what it means to be a data scientist? This domain, that is attracting more and more PhDs, is fairly new, and looking at the job postings out there, it might be difficult to understand exactly what the requirements are and what the job entails. This week, you'll be hearing about Graydon Snyder's journey, from a PhD and postdoc in atmospheric chemistry, to a data scientist position in a fashion retail company. With him, I'll try to paint a clearer picture of what being a data scientist means and of how to prepare yourself to become one. In chemistry, you're always talking about yields and talking about papers published on, on whatever. Uh, there, there are certain metrics that uh, or accomplishments, but, but they don't translate well outside your domain. And I was looking at the things that did translate. One of those was numbers themselves, like my interest in data. So analyzing data, looking at data in the field, in the real world, summarizing it, that sort of thing was broadly of interest to me. Welcome to Papa PhD with David Mendez, the podcast where we explore careers and life after grad school with guests who have walked the road less traveled and have unique stories to tell about how they made their place in a world of constantly evolving rules. Get ready to go off the beaten path and hop on for an exciting new episode of Papa PhD. So today on the Papa PhD mic, I have Graydon Snyder. Graydon grew, up, uh, Graydon grew up in Ottawa, then moved to Montreal for graduate school for a PhD in chemistry, moving to Halifax for work as a postdoc, and finally came back to Montreal, where he currently works at Essence as a data scientist. Formerly a student of atmospheric chemistry, Graydon carried an interest in numbers between various pursuits. His hobbies include running and juggling, and occasionally at the same time. <laughs> Welcome to Papa PhD, Graydon. Thanks for having me. I, I'd really want to, to see that. I don't know if you have <laughs> a, YouTube, a video on YouTube. Uh, juggling while running. I, I juggle a little bit. Uh, but while running, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, we uh, call it joggling. By we, I mean a very small group of people. But um, yeah, I actually went to um, Toronto Waterfront Marathon two years ago to like uh, compete for the Guinness World Record fastest uh, half marathon. Almost got it. <laughs> that's amazing. See, that's not on LinkedIn. I, I love it. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Now I have to go uh, look at at this jo all this juggling, uh, this juggling thing. Is there a, a group, a club, or a, you know, people that you do this uh, with? Uh, a couple of people I know that have also set uh, or attempted records uh, and set records, and they um, are scattered around Canada. It's a small Facebook group. All right. So going back to why, why we're here today, we're here to talk about your uh, your academic and professional journey up till today. And uh, you now hold a position as a data scientist. And uh, this is a term that wasn't so common, or at least that I wasn't aware of 10 years ago when I defended my thesis. And what I'd like today, you know, and, and for the listeners out there, would be to discuss this with you and for you to tell us a little bit more about Uh, your academic journey and how you got to your current position and uh, and also about what it entails what is uh, being a data scientist yeah it's it's not a journey that i anticipated so i can say right off the bat it was not something that i grew up saying i always knew i wanted to be uh, some people have those stories i can't say that i am one of them But when I was in Ottawa growing up, I was um, pretty much uh, just after being born. So earliest memories are Ottawa and high school, et cetera. I was pretty um, focused on sciences, um, sort of a mixture of math, chemistry, um, not so much computers, actually. I wasn't really like a programming kind of person. Um, so, so that wasn't part of the formula, but I, I really liked asking questions uh, where the answers didn't change all the time. So um, chemistry, math, and physics were, were kind of the most grounded subjects for me. So I, I was sort of at an early stage pursuing those uh, to one degree of emphasis or another. And when I first started university at Carleton University, which is also in Ottawa, um, I was spending my undergraduate primarily focused on chemistry, uh, pure and applied. So you, you take classes, you take um, a mixture of 
physics um, and and everything to support that understanding and and again the programming was actually quite secondary there wasn't a lot of computer work I did some computational chemistry um, but it was really just running programs more like running simulations but you weren't really like tearing apart the code itself so a lot of my curiosity was driven by things that I could um, like handle directly. I was interested in chemistry in particular because it was something that even though on a blackboard, say you draw a molecule, if you scale up that molecule to many um, uh, millions and billions of millions of uh, those molecules, you, you you get a substance. So, so it was like the smallest unit um, of the world that you could explain that you could also see in real life. Um, so that was kind of an attraction. And then using the math and the physics and everything to explain that. But um, in terms of career, um, so this is all just pure academic pursuit. So understanding the, the building blocks of life, I totally see the, the, the interest and the curiosity in trying to understand the minute uh, ways the world works. Yeah, yeah. And um, it was the the driving force was was just that curiosity so it didn't have an end goal per se i wasn't looking at um a very career focused i like i was very exploratory i was trying to take in the idea that university was about wandering a bit um discovering things that you like and it was also maybe the other thing was um and and this is i guess something we can also get to is the specialization the the notion of specialization i i would kind of bought into the idea that you you start off broadly and and then as as you climb the academic ladder you you narrow into something more focused over time and and that was maybe in in the back of my mind not consciously but a driving force nonetheless that I would slowly pursue a more precise career that would sort of inevitably come out of the specialization so once I've reached that pinnacle or that peak of specialization that I would then uh, move on to like working in something related to that um, because I would have this like very niche area that I would understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is the, the academic uh, journey and the research, the researcher's journey. I, I, I yeah, I totally agree. It's, it, 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 it does make sense. It's interesting that at that age, you already had uh, th that view. It must have made it uh, for you a, a very, a very structured path towards something that you, you that you could uh, envision in the future yeah it it was not clear what that path was leading to but it was like as you take a step forward things narrow and and it was encouraged i i must say that that was kind of the um thing we all um bought into as you even go into chemistry you you first sort of do a little bit of everything but as you specialize um when i went to So jumping to Montreal, when I graduated, um, my undergrad, of course, was a bit of everything. I had some interest in atmospheric chemistry. So I decided for my graduate school, I would do more atmospheric chemistry. So the interesting thing there is that I, I was um, starting to have my doubts once I actually did ramp up to specialize because I had these very fundamental questions that, that were creeping into my mind, like, is this really the thing I want to be doing for the rest of my life. Um, this seems like like a very focused topic that I chose. What if I wanted to try something else? So uh, tell me if I understood right. So you, you started your PhD thinking, okay, I'm going to narrow this down a little bit. But then, and I, I, this is what I understood, I, I, please confirm that I, that I got this right, you felt already that it was quite narrow. Is that, is that what you... Yeah, exactly. So it's almost... Um... I mean, the, the thing that I actually studied at that point was uh, mercury. I was interested in gaseous mercury, and it was this very niche area. It's not it's not known uh, as a uh, hazard the way um, global warming is. Um, it's it, it has pocket areas of concern. Um, it's it's an interesting area thing to to measure in the atmosphere because it's very um, clear when it's there. Um, there's no question when you when you detect it, even at small levels, it's It's um, it's interesting the way it would um, bioaccumulate. So it, it had a circulation throughout the world, which is unexpected. Uh, and it was certainly an interesting area to pursue for a little while. But it was like um, 
to some degree, after a while, I realized it felt a bit arbitrary that like I had chosen this particular specialty and like, why, why did I choose this? I couldn't quite explain it even to myself. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so this happened at uh, year, year two, year three, uh, right from the outset, from the outset, uh, when, when did this feeling arise? It, it was a it was a creeping feeling, and because the first few years of graduate school, and the other thing I should mention is that it was directly a PhD. Um, it was a bit of a popular thing at the time. Um, I was with friends who started chemistry at the same time, and their graduate studies were in different subjects. But we, a lot of us had done the PhD directly from undergrad, so it wasn't highly unusual. I was around peers that were doing the same, but. Um, Historically, that's unusual. Normally, you do a master's. So I basically jumped in the deep end, okay. you could say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, a, a master's would have, in that ramping up that you mentioned before of building up something, the ma the master's would have given you ex some extra steps to get your bearings, maybe, uh, you know, uh, try your hand at the uh, uh, domain and then see, okay, this is really not for me. And, but you jumped at the, deep, at the deep end, like you said. And so... The question that that comes up for me for, uh, after you say that is, how did you deal with that? How did you try to you know get your bearings and uh, and uh, feel oriented and and um, take uh, uh, hold, let's say, of the um, yeah of the ship in in a way that is a PhD? I think I I, I kind of pushed back. I continued my studies, but I, I pushed back in more subtle ways. Um, I. I deliberately attempted to unspecialize. Um, I started reading more broadly, uh, watching movies um, from all kinds and uh, time periods. I joined the track and field club. I started just reading on other subjects. Um, I was getting into, interested into running, but I was also interested in the science of running. Um, I started a small blog. Um, it was never like a big hit or anything, but it was just a place to write down thoughts um, on subjects that had nothing to do specifically with my eventual PhD. So these, these were just like my attempts at researching things that were still of interest to me. And they weren't necessarily going to lead to a degree, but I found them productive for just how I thought about things, understood things. I imagine joining track and field, you joined this uh, community in a way. You you had uh, you had uh, people there that that had that were like minded and that, that that enjoyed running. I don't know if they enjoyed the science of running, but at least running that that must have been good for you. Yeah, a few of them were, and I found somebody uh, um, that I could talk to about that sometimes. And also online, you have a few conversations with people about the subject, and you know, going all this way to reading research papers and trying to. Uh, play around with the numbers and it, it was it was just a it was a side thing but it was just a way of uh, expressing and reminding myself that i had a other interest in this one very particular specialty that on paper that's what i was pursuing if you're preparing to launch your podcast you may be asking yourself what hosting platform to use i launched papa phd on blueberry because i wanted a professional service that would interface with my wordpress website that would robustly broadcast Papa PhD to all platforms, and that would allow me to grow my podcast in years to come. If you're starting a serious podcast project, do consider one of the first podcasting hosts out there offering state-of-the-art services, including IAB certified statistics, based on years of experience in the podcasting space. So go to papaphd.com forward slash blueberry, that is spelled B-L-U-B-R-R-Y, Or use the promo code PapaPhDBlue in one word on the Blueberry website to unlock a one-month free trial of the platform. That's really interesting. And uh, question: Did you um, ha have um, you know? Did you uh, go to any uh, uh, university services to help you at at this, at this time deal with this doubt, or did you just uh, you know through your own uh, through your own means? decided to em embark on these things or were there other tools that you that helped you in deciding okay you know i'm doing this phd but i'm also broadening uh, my my interests and and putting more time into other aspects of my life 
because it's not an easy decision right being in a phd having a you know a pi that that expects uh, uh, something and seeing peers that are either doing better or, or or worse than you but that you compare yourself to it's hard to decide to take this decision that uh, it, it's a brave decision to take let's say what you did to to kind of diversify and and broaden yeah so it it was all um very um uh, improvised but i i would speak to other people i'd i'd look for friends to confide my doubts about this whole idea of like specialization um i was thankfully um looking at people that would do other things because of just keeping your eye peeled for that i I, I didn't see it as the end goal necessarily to get a job as a professor. I, I saw more and more clearly as as the research went on that that was a very limited uh, slice of, of what people do when they graduate. So the concept of becoming a professor became less and less. Uh, I don't know if it ever was honestly my end goal, if I was totally uh, true to my own thinking, but it, it was definitely something you're supposed to think about. Yeah. Because that's the way, as of today, still that's the way it's set up. You, you, you get into graduate school, and the objective that is put, you know, in front of you at the top of Mount Everest is that. Uh, yeah. But but uh, you started seeing that it was the possibility to get there was you know the probability was low. You like numbers, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You do the math. <laughs> and, uh... It wasn't a very good bet, uh, or you know, it's not a. It's not a bet that that's very easy to to uh, to win in a way. Yeah, so so I I think after that it was the biggest question was um, there there reached a tipping point where I knew I was going to graduate. Um, I I would finish it off. There was uh, more pros and cons to to completing, but but I had to very uh, strategically think about what the next step would be. And so at the, at this point you mentioned that your kind of your safety network let's call it like that was friends maybe family with whom you were discussing these thoughts so how important do you do you feel these conversations were in keeping uh keeping a, a positive outlook on the outcome uh which was like you say coming up the the the, the graduation and and what was coming next yeah, so I think a lot of what I learned from peers was first just the options and and to like remind myself of all the different trajectories that people take in uh, life. I mean, it, I, I admit that it's not a very um, broad on a global scale slice of, of uh, human life that I was interacting with at that point. It was still within the academic world of McGill University. That's where I was doing my PhD. And uh, so it was other people from McGill and whatnot, but but it was just like it, it was just looking for ideas. It wasn't um, comparing yourself to everyone, but it was just you're you're picking and choosing uh, what what are the options, what what can I try next. And so the graduation was coming up, and you you started thinking about okay, what are the next steps? What was that reflection? What were the maybe the numbers or the, the what what were the the factors that came into mind and that set you up for what came next for graduating and then you'll tell us what happened next but h- how was that all that reflection and always i'm when i ask these questions i'm always thinking of the listeners out there who are right now feeling exactly how you did and and because there's a lot of people that get to this point they see that being a professor Happen, you know, is possible for some people, but not for a hundred percent of the people, and they get to this this questioning. So it's interesting for me on the show to share with them how people go through this reflection, what you know, what pros and cons they find, and how they kind of anchor themselves and and get ready to, you know, to 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 the transitions that are coming up. Yeah. So one of the things I I took a step back to assess was how my interests. Uh, could translate to other things. So like, what have I learned so far that would be useful in another field? So some things are translatable and others are not. Um, If you really know um, how to make a good uh, reaction, you know, in chemistry, you're always talking about yields and talking about, um, you know, papers published on on whatever. Uh, There are certain metrics that, uh, or accomplishments, but, but they don't translate well outside your domain. And I was looking at the things that did translate. One of those was numbers themselves, like my interest in data. So analyzing data, looking at data in the field, in the real world, summarizing it, that sort of thing was broadly of interest to me. 
Okay. And so eventually you uh, defended, you t- so you turned in your thesis, defended, uh, graduated. So what happened next? Uh, what was the next step in your journey? So I spent a few um, months looking online for um, professors who uh, might be interested in, in someone with my background who had a bit of interest in trying something a little new. And I'd say the next part was luck. And um, I was messaging a few people, and one of them was a professor in Halifax, and this is in Dalhousie University. He was um, just so happened to be looking for somebody uh, with a interest in a combination of some computer programming, field work, and also uh, like data analysis uh, in general for a new project that he was just about to start. Uh, it was an air quality analysis. So it it was like a really good uh, transition because it was using my knowledge of atmosphere chemistry um, for this postdoc, but it was also exploring into new areas. This was a project that had not been um, tried before in its current format. It was like a bit of air quality sampling. We would, So he summarized it as, um, I'm looking for someone who's going to be able to set up these air quality instruments around the world uh, keep them maintained, analyze the results in a chemistry lab, uh, be able to synthesize the data uh, from around the world, and finally uh, help publish papers on it. But but the real goal is not to just manufacture papers, it's like to set up the network. Mm. Yeah, so it does sound like it was a perfect fit for you. <laughs> oh, it was it was really great. I mean, Halifax is a wonderful city. Uh, but on top of that, it, it broadened the horizon. So in, in sort of an hourglass shape, I had sort of specialized to this point uh, when I had graduated, but then I kind of opened up again um, where I was trying these new things. So it's like running programs. Yeah, so my postdoc was, was a moment of unspecializing. Unspecialized, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but also gaining a lot of new uh, exp- experiences, like adding a bunch of new arrows to your quiver in a way that, that you wouldn't have if you have kept uh, focusing uh, more and more. That sounds very, very cool. Um, the question I had wa- was, how was it to uh, deciding to go to Halifax? So you had... You know, you had your your life uh, here in Montreal. Was that was that just uh, at the time uh, an easy decision to take? It wasn't terribly difficult. Um, so I was um, just about to get married at the same time. Um, my wife moved out there with me, and it it was um, not uh, the easiest thing to move. Um, just when you get comfortable somewhere, but I would say that it was not nearly as challenging as, as uh, I'm sure some people's stories about moving to other countries. It was really just another province one time zone away. So it, it was very, um, it, it, w- it was very like achievable to, to just uh, pack up and, and move there without complicating our lives too much. Uh, so, so that wasn't a big barrier. I think it was just a conceptual barrier. Once, once you arrive somewhere, you realize it wasn't as hard as you thought to get there a lot of the times. Excellent. And, and once you got there, were you able to resume uh, things like uh, running and, you know, having a group of people with whom you, you kind of developed the same interests that you did uh, when you were back in Montreal? Yeah, for sure. I, I kept that same philosophy of, of this like outside group of people that, that were um, in other fields and other interests. And, and so the running group became really integral part of um, the Halifax experience. Uh, the club that I started was actually very small when I joined uh, it was like three of us and then by the time i left my um, coach became uh, somewhat of a um, mecca for runners it just kind okay. of snowballed <laughs> I, it's it's a long complicated story about how that happened but but it, by the time i left there was a quite a large group of people so um yeah it, it was it was a really good group to hang out with uh, for the four and a half years that i was there very cool and again uh, for the listeners out there i think uh, from the people i have interviewed uh, those who have had these groups uh, around uh, a certain phys- like sports 
uh, usually the the feeling I get is they're quite uh, close or tight knit groups. Uh, people uh, really, um, the you know, uh, how can I say? It's kind of a second family. That's the feeling that I get from from people who I've interviewed who've been doing sports, be it at a almost professional level or just rec recreationally in a way. But um, yeah, if you are inclined towards doing sports, it's a great way, especially if you're doing your PhD, and, but you're from abroad. Uh, having a, a group of people with whom you do sports is a great way to have a, a nice uh, social network and and and, uh, and a nice second family in a way. <laughs> For sure, um, to have a, that that sort of community that of of people that that kind of give you a sanity check when when work is not um, going as planned or um, you know you just need an outlet. Um, like you said, it doesn't have to be um, at any particular caliber or. Um, It's just the goal of, of having this other group that, that you associate with um, outside of work. Because academia is dangerous for you mix your um, free time and your spare time with um, your work time and they, they become blurred. I worked in a lab where thankfully we weren't ourselves this obsessed, but um, they, they would stay in the lab till quite late, like 9 p.m. on a Saturday. You could find them. And, and I was just like, no, I like this this should be time for socializing. I, I just, this has <laughs> gone too far. Yeah. And for family, right? You, you yeah. even had your wife there with you. Uh, so four and a half years uh, d doing your postdoc. Um, and, and, you know, again, we were, we were just saying how you, you had time to create a, a community even outside uh, work and outside uh, the, the academic milieu. But um, my question to you is you had, had this feeling during the PhD, okay, this is, too focused what 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 is this going to serve what, what am i going to do with this in the real world and then you found this postdoc where again like you said you you widen your horizons you learn many new things you got you got into different projects things that you you, you hadn't before uh, interacted with more people i imagine from the nature of what you, you you know what you tell me um how was that experience and how was a postdoc Uh, as you described, which sounds that it was really interesting, how did it fit in the puzzle of the life that you foresaw, uh, that you were foreseeing for yourself? So towards the end of my four years there, and uh, there were great four years that, that I spent um, traveling. I got to visit India, Bangladesh, um, oh, wow. Argentina. <laughs> so, so these air quality instruments, so like when I saw the pinpoints on the map before I traveled, I was like, this is gonna be really cool so it helped motivate like the parts of the work that weren't maybe as um you know exciting but uh yeah to sum up like after that was all done it's like well what did i get from all this and and i kind of realized i was much more in a position to think about um industry and and projects where that kind of thing happens all the time you start from the ground up you say hey we're going to try this thing that we haven't tried before it's not built on necessarily decades of academic research it's Um, it's something new. And so this project in my interpretation of it was could have just as easily been a, a private enterprise, you know, maybe like a much, much smaller version of SpaceX, where like you have something that's scientific, but it's also commercial in, in pursuit. In fact, we, we were combining some of our technologies with a private company that was also a startup uh, to build these instruments. So So we had this like interplay of the startup mentality, research, um, project goals, as opposed to publishing goals. And when I took it all in, combined with my own interests of the data analysis, I said, well, this, this kind of feels like this validates my original idea that I should be going more into industry, where I, I knew from anecdotal experience anyway, that these, these were the types of traits that I clearly was enjoying more that also were found more in, in the industry collaborations. Mm -hmm. uh, excellent Graydon uh, we're reaching the, the half point of the interview and this is a great moment to, to, to have a, our, our little pause uh, super super interesting it, it totally makes sense and we're gonna pick up after the after the after the break uh, and uh, talk a little bit more about that and about what you do today which is uh, uh, I'm, again I'm very curious about uh, being a, a data scientist again something that's uh, that uh, I think today is a a professional um, avenue for a lot of people out there and uh, I'd like the listeners to, to learn a little bit about that so we'll take our break and then uh, resume uh, for, for part two 
I just want to take a moment before going on with the interview to let you know that you can help me end the show by leaving a star rating and a comment on your podcasting app. If you're not on Apple Podcasts, you can now leave your rating and review by visiting papaphd.com forward slash podchaser. If you want to go a step further, go to patreon.com slash papaphd now and become a supporter. For the equivalent of a coffee per month, you'll be helping me immensely with the recurring costs of hosting and producing the show. Again, thank you for being a true fan. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Papa PhD podcast. Head over to papaphd.com for show notes and for more food for thought about non-academic postgrad careers. I'll always be happy to share inspiring stories, new ideas and useful resources here on the podcast. So make sure you subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts to always keep up with the discussion and to hear from our latest guests.